God is holy. And he's awesome. Did you hear that today? He's holy and he's awesome. Hallelujah. Wow. I wasn't expecting that, to be honest with you. So Roxanne this week said, um, you know, Mick, what do, we, what do you want to title the message this week? And I said, I don't know, but I said, I'll get back to you. And I asked her if she had any ideas, and she said no. But um, what happened was um, I was reading through uh, Gospel of Mark, and chapter 13 hit me, and um, the word stay alert. It might be translated differently in other versions, but stay alert uh, really stood out to me. So I said, how about stay alert? So that's the title today, and I'll explain. Um, Nothing I'm going to say today is new. Um, Nothing that I'm going to say hasn't been said before. So if you haven't heard it before, then praise God, then hopefully it's something that that hits you. Um, If you have heard it before, you know, then hopefully it's a reminder. Um, I think we need reminding. I think the, the scriptures go through the history of Israel and how there was great uh, revival and, and joy and there was unity and then not so much. Um, but God gave us some things to, to remind us. And he gave us the Shabbat as a reminder too. So we're here to, to honor and praise him for that. And so the, the message today um, is really about deception. And we're warned over and over and over and over again about deception um, Yeshua himself said even the very elect will be deceived. And I don't know what qualifies as the very, very elect, but it means the ones that, that know the truth um, and operating in it. So the dictionary says that deception is the act of causing someone to accept as true, which is false, or accepting something as false that is true. Um, it's a trick. It's crafty. It's a procedure or practice that's meant to deceive or defraud. So when did it start? That's the question. We know deception is, is real because we read about it. I'm sure a lot of us have been um, victims of deceit or defraud or, or deception. So the question is, when did it start? So uh, let's jump into the beginning in Genesis chapter 3. And I'm going to go through verses 1 and 6. Now before this chapter starts, everything was perfect. God had established his creation. Everything was perfect. Right? That's what we're trying to get back to. That's what we're waiting for. So when we say he's the one who is and is and is to come, that's that's what we're looking forward to. Okay? So let's start with now the serpent was more crafty than any wild animal which Adonai God had made. He said to the woman, Eve, did God really say you are not to eat from any tree in the garden? Well, how crafty is the enemy? First of all, he's more crafty than any wild animal that God had made. And he made him, right? So how do we compete with that? If he's the most crafty, how are we going to compete with that? Now that's a question in and of itself, and hopefully we'll find that answer here today. But see what he's doing here. And this happens all the time. Setting the hook. It's just setting the hook. It's just a question. Questioning, did God really say this? Happens all the time. So... The woman answered, we may eat from the fruit of the trees of the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you are neither to eat from it nor touch it or you will die. So she answers, she doesn't totally get it correct because she adds something to to that. It's not the focus, but we see that she knows what God said, but there's a little crack in the armor, right? There's a little crack in the armor. The serpent said to the woman, It is not true that you will surely die because God knows that on that day you will eat from it and your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. I mean, there's the lie right there. There's the lie. But it starts with that question. It says you won't die. You're not going to die because you're setting the hook. God doesn't want you to know stuff. He doesn't want you to have things. It's just it's, it's catering to your cravings, your fleshly cravings. So what happens? Um... What happens, I'll just give a quick example of this, and this is 
not, I'm not making political statements here. Believe me, I'm not. But what grieves me is in society today, we see things like pro-life being attacked as anti-woman or anti-abortion, right? And it's really pro-choice is what they table it, right? So the words are just kind of shifted a little bit. And it's like, well, God wants you to have choices, right? And so people use extreme examples to say that everything needs to be put out. And it's just not true. But we, we're not standing firm on that because we're, we've allowed as a society, it's not really our fault it's sitting here today, but over the, the last century or so, God's been taken out of everything. School. I mean, you can't even say the Pledge of Allegiance anymore, I think, in schools because you say one nation under God. Well, that could offend somebody. Well, everybody's offended by everything today. And um, I'm telling you now that, that if we really read this and we really know who made us, it's offensive to people. Are we experiencing that today? Okay, I am, and I, I, it makes me nuts. But um, uh, Verse 6. So here it is. She fell for it. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it had a pleasing appearance, and that the tree was desirable for making one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate. So if we stopped there, we would say, wow, Eve, nice work. A lot of guys, I think, say that still, even though they don't read the rest of that verse, saying she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And we remember this. It's Adam's sin, right? And, and Adam all die, it says, right? It doesn't say in Eve. So his responsibility and his position, he failed. He was deceived. I don't know. That's what I see. So if we check the Bible, we'll see that that's the truth. We have imputed now that sin upon us until we are born again of the Spirit. Until then. So um, Rabbi Greg taught about something that's related to this, that it was so precious and deep, and I really encourage you guys to go back and watch it. It was about the lust of the flesh, uh, the lust of the eyes, and he does like a five-part series on this from a year ago called No Greater Love. I really, man, it, it just, like all the teachings, right? But that one just speaks to what was going on here. So disobedience always has consequences. You know, sometimes they're delayed. I think sometimes we think we get away with it. I know I've been there. And then, thank God, he reminds me, remember when? I hate that because you know what? I knew better. I knew better. I knew better. And I didn't heed the warning. But God will let us make those choices. And thank God, by his grace, we're still here. We're still here. So deception's not new, right? It started a long time ago before we were here. Um, it's a very reason that we need a Savior. So when I'm in the business of forensic accounting, and last time I was up here, I, I didn't move away from this because I was terrified, and I still am, but I'll stay close enough. Okay, last, last time I told you I, I do forensic accounting for a living, which is a, fa it's a fancy term for really looking into um, more financial issues related to fraud and embezzlement and things like that. Um, you probably read about it in the papers and people do, you know, they cheat people and steal all the time. So I deal with deception all the time in terms of interviewing people. And there's skills on how to interview people and to get what's coming, you know, to get out of them. And a lot of it's asking questions. And so you sort of know somebody may have done something wrong because you have the evidence. Yeah, I'm going to go back here. <laughs> um, they might have the evidence, but you're like, hey, look at this. Um, these, this information doesn't add up. So I had a case about 10 years ago now, and everybody remembers 2008, 2009, when we had the big real estate market crash, right? And what happens during market crashes is a lot of the stuff that's hidden comes to the surface. And I had this guy who's a major real estate guy, and he was... I mean, he's just filthy rich, but he had built just about every major um, residential uh, units in, in Michigan and for a number of years, but he built a great amount of wealth in real estate. So what happens is you keep investing and keep investing, but he had this young guy that he brought up, and he trained him, and this guy was a great worker, and he did great things, and he paid him fairly well. Um, but what happened was people were talking to him and saying, hey, man, you know, don't you think you should be making a little more? Is he really taking that good care of you? So you see how he, that hook was set in him. Well, he took the bait. And what he did was he started to um, write checks and, and put it into the system a little bit differently. Um, he had started buying things on credit cards. 
for like he built houses. I mean, I'm talking major stuff, right? And over time, he would present to my client, who was the very wealthy or now formerly wealthy real estate guy, all these uh, financial statements and things that looked really legitimate. So he trusted him. He just went, wow, it seems like we're doing well. Well, what happens when the market crashed? He said, well, where's all this money? And the guy actually left. He took off. So that's a good sign that he probably did something wrong. But we got down to the heart of it, and we found about $7 million that this guy stole. I mean, crazy amount of money. And uh, this guy who had houses and planes, I mean, houses all over the country, because he had leveraged and he invested so much, when the bank came, it not only wiped out all of his holdings, but it wiped out his cash, too. So, destitute. So it can happen. And I know he was a very proud man because he would boast about all the things he had. And he said, I want to fly you down to Florida and play some golf. And I said, yeah, I mean, that sounds great. Super nice guy. Really giving, but broke because of deception. Because of deception. So it's not a great example. It's not a parallel example. But there was an example in the book of Joshua that I was just like, wow. And I, I know there's a lot of things about this story that we can go into. There's a lot of grace in this story. Um, there's a lot of fear, things like that. But at, at this point in the, in the book, we're going to go look at Joshua 9 in a second. Uh, but at this point, the children of Israel had taken over Jericho. And they had destroyed Ai, or Ai, Ai. And their orders were straightforward. The inhabitants of the land would be completely destroyed. And they were moving, right? And these, this group of Hivites from the, the, the area of Gibeonite, the Gibeonites, um, they were terrified because they knew what was going on. So um, you can't blame them, though, right? They're going to go and, and create a deception because they're about to be annihilated. So it's not like you can totally blame them for that. Uh, but we're going to look at this section of Scripture. And again, I'm not going to get into everything, but I want to focus on a few different parts of this story and tie them into some other things that I think we should be considering. Uh, so but here, uh, Joshua 9, 3 through 9, and then 12 through 16 but when the inhabitants of Giva heard what Yehoshua, Joshua, had done to Jericho and I, they developed a clever deception. They made themselves look as if they had been on a long journey by putting old sacks on their donkeys and taking used wineskins that had burst and been mended back together. They put old patched sandals on their feet and dressed in worn out clothes and took as provisions nothing but dried up bread that was crumbling to pieces. Then they went to Joshua in the camp of Gilgal and said to him and the men of Israel, We have come from a far away, from far away, a country far away. Now make a covenant with us. Let's continue. Is that the next one? Okay, sorry. The men of Israel said to the Hivi, How do we know? So they're asking the right question. How do we know that you don't live here among us? If you do, we don't want to make a covenant with you. So they knew. If they're from here, no covenant. Yehoshua asked, who are you and where do you come from? So he asked sort of the general question first, right? Saying, hey, we're not going to do this with you. But then he gave a direct question. That's something that you do as well. You might ask a, a general question to sort of get some feedback, but then you go for it. Where, who, who are you and where are you from? They answered him. Your servants have come from a very distant country. Okay, because of the reputation of Adonai, your God. We have heard reports about him, everything he did in Egypt. They knew they're headed for destruction. So here it comes. Here is the bread which we took for our provisions. It was still warm when we took it out from our homes on the day we left to come to you. Now look at it. It's dry and turned to crumbs. Let's continue. And these wineskins were new when we filled them. But look, now they're torn. See more evidence. Likewise, these clothes of ours and our shoes are worn out because of this very long journey. So they were adding evidence upon evidence upon evidence that they presented to them to show that they really were from a faraway country. The men sampled some of the food, so they took some of it, and they tasted it, and they're like, well, I'm sure it was disgusting. So that's what they relied upon. It says, but they didn't seek the advice of Adonai. So Yehoshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to spare their lives, and the leading officials of the community swore to them. 
But three days later, after they had made the covenant with them, they heard that they were their neighbors and that they lived there with them. Now, again, not getting into the part where um, the children of Israel were really upset at their leadership for allowing this to happen. You know, sometimes leaders make mistakes. You know, how do you, how do you, atta- how do you approach them on that? Do you attack them? Or do you say, okay, we've made, now, now let's move forward. But you know what the beautiful thing is? They kept their word because of the fear of Adonai. They kept their word. And, but the point is, they didn't seek the Lord. So when we make decisions, when we make covenants, I mean, covenants, marriage, you might look good. She might be beautiful. She might fill every desire of your heart. But did you seek the Lord in the decision? Is this whom God has for you? So on that front, maybe, man, I didn't realize that she had that or he believed this. You didn't check the source, but you know what? You made a covenant, and I think that's also what what the Lord is showing us here. Um, So what I think is important to demonstrate through this is how do we know what's true and what's not? Obviously, the answer is seek the Lord, but how do we do that practically? How do we do that practically? Rabbi Greg says all the time, if you don't know the authentic, you won't be able to spot the counterfeit. Right? So if we're looking at uh, watching, you know, teachings online and things, and we're not getting into, into here, into this word, the test is, is that really what God is saying? I, I listened to a teaching yesterday, 28 minutes, beautiful, well-spoken, eloquent. You know what it was about? Deception. I'm not kidding. And I... It was all about what do you want. There was no message of, of sin or conviction. In fact, when they said Galatians 5.19 about the sinful nature, the, the teacher said, take away sinful because that might be harsh for you guys. And I went, I just went, my God, we're so deceived. So even when you hear a teaching on deception, test it. Make sure what you're hearing here is in there. So today, I want to thread the needle a little bit because I think we have to look at the different sources to see is what this says here going to really make a difference? Are we really seeing what that says? Is God real? What does God say about it? Um, Proverbs 7, 7, 2, and 3. Obey my commands and live. Guard my teaching like the pupil of your eye. Bind them on your fingers and write them on the tablets of your heart. That's in the Proverbs, and we know that it says it in the beginning of Joshua that we just read that first chapter. Check it out. Don't just skip the first eight verses and read one, one nine. Read the whole, the whole thing. Um, that word bind, let's look at that for a second. Kashar, to confine, tie, physically or mentally love. The physically or mentally loved. So we, when he says, bind them for a sign upon your hands and write them on the front, front lips of your, your mind. These are what he's talking about. It's mentally loving, which led me to look at Psalm 119.11. I treasure your word in my heart so that I won't sin against you. Do we truly treasure his word? I mean... We have to hold it close to us, and we're supposed to guard it because, look, it says we won't sin against him if we treasure it. And one of the sayings that Rabbi Greg teaches, and I might reference him a lot, but forgive me, but when he teaches and he gives you a short sentence or a short few words, he bottom lines it, and he helps you to understand it. So I'm borrowing from that. But I Forgive me. But don't sacrifice what you want in the moment for what you want the most. You have to know the Lord and truly desire him. So what I would say is what you want the most is what you want the most, his presence in your life, his guidance in your life, his peace in your life. you got to stay true to his word, and you have to embrace it as a treasure. Like, we love it. We guard it with everything we have. Not haphazard, not sitting collecting dust, not a verse in the morning, and then just going on and doing whatever you're doing. No, treasure it. Another saying that I, I really like um, I learned from my wife, but I think she got it from somebody else, so I'm not giving credit to anybody. But it was, don't do permanent things with temporary people. 
I'm looking over here because it's for all of us, but particularly for the young people. Look, there's a lot of people in your life right now. They're temporary. You can do permanent things with them that will change the course of your life. And if we learn anything from the children of Israel or Joshua, check with the Lord. Find out, is this friend a good friend for me? Am I influencing them or are they influencing me? And then surround yourself with people that love God the same way because we need to, we need to stand together, especially in these times. The bottom line is the word of God should be our greatest treasure. And if it's not, I pray that you pray that God changes your heart in this regard. It's always on our end of the equation. So Yeshua says a lot about deception, particularly as it relates to the end days. And are we in the end days? Okay, that wasn't that loud. We are in the end days, folks. I really, I'm just going to say it. So look around. I was in the uh, airport on Wednesday morning. I was on the uh, Pacific time, but uh, I did a test. And I felt like the Lord said, look around. And he said, what do you see? And I looked around, and I looked at each person. And there's a lot of people in the airport. It's kind of busy right now because, well, it was because the government was shut down. Um, But I looked around, and each person I looked at had their head in either a phone, a a laptop, a tablet. They had earphones on, and they were laying there. But when I looked around, what I noticed is nobody was looking at each other or talking to one another, except for one lady. There's one lady, she was sitting there, and she's like, just smiling, and I thought, man, I love talking to people. I'm going to go up and talk to her. So I got my bag. I looked up, and she was on her phone. <laughs> so I was so crazy about that that I picked up my phone, and I texted my wife, and I'm like, I can't believe these people aren't even looking at it. They're, they're just on their phones. And I went. <laughs> so anyway, let's move on. Okay, back to Yeshua. I know. He knows how to convict me. Back to Yeshua. Okay. Um, he gave a strong warning in the Gospels about deception. And in it, uh, it's referenced in the following representation of him and not being duped about his return. Because when we sing that song today, who was and is and is to come, don't forget that our Redeemer is back and he's going to rule and reign here with us and we're his bride and we should be preparing for that. We can't forget that. That's the deception. Most people don't even realize Yeshua's coming back. I, and believe, they're believers. They're wearing, I'm like, aren't you excited about the Lord's return? Just, no, what? Deception. We have to be careful. Um, Yeshua says either watch out or stay alert seven times in the 13th chapter of Mark, Gospel of Mark. And whenever I see a word that's repeated multiple times, I tend to lean in and really listen because I think the Lord is trying to tell you something. Not that other places aren't, but I think there's the emphasis on that. So let's go to Mark 13. I'm going to only pick out a few of them. Verses 5, 6, and 37. Yeshua again began speaking to them. He's speaking to his Talmudim. Watch out. Don't let anyone fool you. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he. And they will fool many people. And what I say to you, now he says to everyone, stay alert. Stay alert. Let's go to Matthew 24. At that time, many will be trapped into betraying and hating each other. Many false prophets will appear and fool many people. And people's love will grow cold because of increased distance from Torah. But whoever holds out until the end will be delivered. Okay? So let's go, now let's look, because I I saw this word, increased distance from the Torah, and I'm like, wait a minute, that sounds, I don't know if I've read that before here, so let's look at the the breakdown between the CJB, which it says, many people's love will grow cold because of increased distance from Torah. Well, what does it say in the King James? That's the popular version, particularly where we live, and it says, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. Does that say the same thing? It does say the same thing. It does say the same thing. Iniquity is lawlessness. It's being twisted. It's being far from law, far from the Torah. So I think David Stern did something brilliant there when he translated this. People are growing cold because they're far from the Torah. They're far from the Word of God. But he said, stay alert. So he must be saying, 
Let's get close to the Torah. Let's treasure his word. Let's get into it. Um, so I was telling my wife this because I, I, show, I said, look, this is what it says. And she says, what's grow, wax cold mean? I said, I don't know, like wax cold. But she says, look it up. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll look it up. And I did. So it's uh, wax cold in the Greek is psycho. <laughs> to cool or metaphorically waning in love. But I thought that was funny, but not really. That when I said, man, these people are crazy. They don't care about God. Well, they're psychos. They are. They're crazy. Man, I, um, you're crazy not to fall in love with God's word. Okay? You're crazy. Now, there are many examples of warning and deception. And, you know, I, obviously I started with Genesis, looking at Yeshua, but I think it's important. Let's see what the, the epistles say. So let's start with Paul. He speaks of uh, deception, ultimate deception. In 2 Thessalonians, it says in the verses 9 and 10, when this man, this man is the anti-Messiah, who avoids Torah, the lawless one, not the lawful one, the lawless one, the one who is avoiding Torah, when he comes, the adversary will give him power to work all kinds of miracles and signs and wonders. He will enable him to deceive in all kinds of wicked ways. Those who are headed for destruction because they would not receive the love of truth that could have saved them. The love of truth. Agape aletheia. Listen, the word made flesh, Yeshua, is the way, the truth, and the life. He said to us in his prayer, set them apart for holiness by the means of your truth. Your word is truth. He also said the Holy Spirit, that he will send us it's the spirit of truth and it will guide us into all truth. The truth, love the truth, treasure his word. So doing the Torah, keeping Torah and being lawful is good because the lawless one clearly is far from the Torah and he voids it. So let's do a, a quick summary. I want to define this because I know we see this all the time. But again, a reminder. Let's look at what sin is. It's defined in 1 John 3, 4. It's in the New Testament. Everyone who keeps sinning is violating Torah, says the law. Indeed, sin is violation of Torah. So the Torah is what we see, the standard upon which we are either violating God's word or we're not. Okay. There's a lot more we can go into there, but let's continue. 1 John 3, 7. Children, so we know he's talking about sin. Don't let anyone deceive you. It is the person that keeps on doing what is right, who is righteous, just as God is righteous. He is righteous, and we shall try to be righteous as well in our practicality. And deception is what occurs when we don't call sin, sin, and we don't look at his Torah, we pull ourselves back, and then what happens? Did God really say? Well, how do you know? Because you've got to be in the Word, and you can't just read it one time or two times or a hundred times. You've got to stay in there. It's got to be habitual. You've got to keep getting into it. And so let's get to the next verse in 1 John as well, 3.24. Those who obey his commands remain united with him. See John 14. And also, there's an amazing teaching from a few months ago that Rabbi Greg did on John 14. How we remain united with him. Obedience to the commandments. Here's how we know that he remains with us. By the spirit whom he gave us. That one we said leads us into all truth. That's the one. Now, the flesh hates the law of God. I know this from my own experience. Um, if you read First John, the whole thing, it's really a test of, of whether you really believe. I would read 1 John and test yourself. It's really, it's humbling, and I've done it, and I've had to do it more than a few times, so uh, shamefully, but thank God. Um, the flesh hates the law, but the spirit loves the law. It loves it. There's no greater feeling. The question is, which one are we feeding more? Do we feed the, law, the spirit, or do we feed our flesh? Because that's the one that's going to win. That's the one that's going to win. 
not just in the New Testament, but if you look at Proverbs 28, 9, and many of you know this one, but it's, if, if you turn your ear from hearing my Torah, even your prayers will be an abomination. It says it. It's all in there. It's in the Bible. What does that mean? It means that we have to know his word, otherwise we'll be deceived. So the Torah is a mirror, so says the uh, so says James, the brother of Yeshua, who wrote the epistle James, or Yaakov. I'm not going to get into the fact that James' name is not James. It was Yaakov, Jacob. But then, because King James wanted his name in the Bible, um, look, deception, right? It's James. It's Peter. I mean, look, they're translated, but these were Hebrews, Jewish boys, Jewish men, men. So, I'm off track. Here we go. So, anyway... But you have to look into that law that brings liberty. It shows you your faults. But God in his grace will allow us to be washed in his word when we receive Yeshua and he'll transform our lives. It's being born again. Born again of the spirit. Anyway, so how are we going to compare? What are we comparing to? You know, how am I doing? Well, we have a Torah. Um, I thank God for a lot of things, but I do thank God for Rabbi Greg. I'll tell you, tell you there's a number of things I, I, I'm so thankful because of him, but this, this issue really helped, helped me a lot. Keeping Torah is living the Torah. Yeah. Yes, it is. It's not a checklist, but it's a spirit-led obedience which fulfills loving God and loving your neighbor. Yeah. Yeah. Now, some believers in Yeshua think that the Torah is bad, you know, because we're not under the law but they think and they accuse people of keeping it for a means of salvation. So they're deceived. They're deceived. And it just takes a little bit of deception, right, to get us off track. A little bit of leaven will spoil the whole batch of dough. It's, there's so many parallels we can make here. Um, so then there are people that think that keeping Torah saves you. And they lose their love for, for Yeshua. And I'm like, if the Torah could save you, then why did Yeshua have to go through that horrific Sacrifice. So no, they're deceived too. Um, he didn't give us these instructions, guys, so that we could cast them aside. And so, you know, it's, it's not what it says in the, in the word anywhere. It doesn't say, no, you don't keep Torah. It doesn't. Yeshua said he didn't come to abolish it. It's all over the word of God. So we see what Paul says. We know what Yeshua says. We see what John says. Now let's look at uh, Kepha. He must have been close to Yeshua because he gives a similar plea. If I had to sum up Kepha's, Peter's first epistle in today's vernacular, I would say it, it, it would say, the world ain't it. <laughs> I just saw that. I'm like, man, it just, it's just so stark. It's like, man, the world's just not it. But anyway, um, we belong to God and he is sanctifying us. And that's what we signed up for. I know a lot of people don't want to be sanctified. And if I'm honest, my flesh is like, I don't want to be sanctified. I'm, I'm real honest. I'm like, God, I don't, I don't want to be sanctified. But there's no other way. You got to go through it. So 1 Peter 5, 8 through 10, Peter issues this warning. Stay sober. Stay alert. Your enemy, the adversary, stalks around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. It's serious. It is serious. Again, a Rabbi Greg quote. Your enemy does not have a social security number. I mean, when you say that, you go, man, it's, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, right? No. It's not a social security. It's not a person. And the devil's not a, a, you know, they show these pictures of the devil with the pitchfork, you know. That's easy to avoid that. It says that he masquerades himself as an angel of light. How are we going to compete with that? Masquerades as an angel of light. But God is not a God of confusion. He gives us his spirit, and his spirit comports with the word. And if we know the word, we'll know that that's the Holy Spirit, not a familiar spirit, and we will say no to the adversary. So it says, stand against him. Firm in your faith and your trust, knowing that your brothers throughout the world are going through the same kinds of suffering. You will have to suffer only a little while. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. After that, God, who is full of grace, yes, the one who called you to his eternal glory in union with the Messiah, will himself restore, 
establish and strengthen you and make you firm. He said, stay sober. It's a warning. I think he means you drink too much. When you drink too much, you know that part of your brain, I think it's the cerebral cortex, if I'm, it's the part that makes the decisions very quickly. It's dulled. You're, more, you're uninhibited. You will make decisions that you normally wouldn't make because you're filling up with wine, not with the Holy Spirit, like Brother Billy preached last week. I'm drunk on the Holy Spirit. That's where I want to be, right? So stand firm, that's the answer. It means that you have to have faith. It means that you desire obedience to the Lord. Um, people in, in Christian circles, and I love them, my brothers, they say, you know, God just wants obedience. And I say, to what? What's he want you to obey? The commandments are alive and kicking. That's not, that should, it's not a newsflash in this house, but people need to know that. Um, the enemies dupe so many people in the body of believers. And I wouldn't believe it so other than Messiah said it himself, and so did his apostles. It's crazy. They're psychos. Uh, if you're not suffering... Because there's people who, I, I mean, I wasn't suffering, you know, more than five, six, seven years ago now. I wasn't totally suffering. I knew God was calling me in my heart. But this letter, this, this letter that Kepha has, it won't mean as much to people who aren't actually going through it. So it's an encouragement to me. It's, I know it's an encouragement to so many. Um, so God has prescriptions and his warnings for us not to lose focus. And one of the things that I think is really important, not just to treasure his word, but he, he gave us something in the Proverbs as well. And I tell my kids about this all the time. I've been trying to teach it to them forever. Um, but it's Proverbs 4, 23 through 25. Above everything else, guard your heart. For as the source of life's consequences... Your heart will make decisions. When they hear these songs, listen to your heart. I'm like, no, do not listen to your heart. No, it's deceitfully wicked above all things. You can't understand it. It says, keep crooked speech out of your mouth. Banish deceit from your lips. Proverbs 6, it says there's six things that the Lord hates. Seven is an abomination to him. Three of them have to do what comes out of here. Three of them, three out of the seven. We're supposed to guard this. Look, we listen to music. I know, listen to music. Music, it's the window to the soul. Everyone listens. They love music. What type of music you listen to? Because what comes in here or through here is likely to come out here. Yeah. I've experienced that. Yeah. It's not a good witness. And it's, it's something we have to guard against. So the Lord's saying, guard it. Now let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze on what lies in front of you. Yeah. And when I saw that, I thought, hmm, I remember seeing that somewhere. I, had to, I think I Googled it because I, I didn't remember exactly where it was. But Hebrews 11.26 says, He had come to regard abuse suffered on behalf of the Messiah as riches or greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he kept his eyes fixed on the reward. Who is he talking about? I know you know, so hold on. Who is he talking about? Moshe. Moses. But look, could you see yourself there? You think God can say this about you? I think, I think he's the example, and I think that that book and that particular chapter is an, an example of how we're supposed to conduct our lives, focused, fixing on the reward, staying in his word, not being duped. So today, what do we have? I'm just going to say this because I think our culture is really influencing the body of believers. It does me, but I feel a strong conviction about it. We have cheap or fast food. We don't rewarm our leftovers anymore. We, we nuke them, right? We don't want to work hard anymore. I mean, I know there's people that work hard, but we don't want to work hard and save for something that we want. We put it on a credit card. The word says that the borrower is a slave to the lender. So it's a form of slavery, right? Because you're not free. You got to pay your debt. But did you want that thing or those things more than what you wanted that that God wanted you to have? I mean, I get these glossy little uh, credit card applications in the mail, particularly around the holiday season. It says, prepare for the holidays. I'm like, thank God I don't do that anymore because I remember how many months I'd have to pay off those debts. Freedom. Uh, praying for rain. 
Remember praying for the winter rain so that we'd have a spring harvest? No, I'm going to go to Kroger. And then when I go to Kroger, I'm going to go, come on, what's taking so long? Because I don't want to wait more than 30 seconds for the guy behind the meat counter to actually finish with what he was doing. You know, it's, it's really a bad witness, but we're becoming conformed into that and not into the image of Messiah. And that's what we're supposed to conform into. And people don't fear God like they used to. I mean, not that like they used to, like I'm a, some old guy, like all oh, back in my day. But there seems to be more of a reverence for God's holiness and his awesomeness. And today we don't see it. We just, we don't, we don't see it. It grieves me, actually. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about a guy, another real estate guy. And um, it's an example of someone who doesn't know the Lord. But he had a, a big real estate job. That he was real, this big project that he was going to close on, and he needed to get to the closing. And he was driving around in Manhattan, and he couldn't find a parking space. He's going crazy. He's like, I can't find a parking space. There's none open. It was the busiest day. So he finally says, you know what, God, if you're real, I need a parking spot. And if you give me a parking spot, I will serve you. The rest of my days, I will open an orphanage. I will do all these things in your name forever. And immediately, the spot opened up. He goes, God, never mind. (laughs) It's funny, but it's not. It's funny, but it's not. Now, hear me out. The smartphone was supposed to make us smarter and our lives easier. Remember, Brother Dwayne said that a couple weeks ago. Why do we think that? It's a lie. We've been deceived. Doesn't make us happier. That's the lie, too. Where are we spending our time and our talent and our treasure? That's where you find people's God and their idols. We're supposed to have no other gods before him. But if we throw the commandments away, we won't know that. People will say, you have to unhitch from the Old Testament makes me sick when I hear that. It's unbelievable. And people are buying that. So if you throw away the Old Testament, and then you also ignore what Yeshua did in chapter 4 of Matthew, when he was tempted by the adversary, that's the example. What did he use? He used Deuteronomy three times. And Satan used Psalms 91. Right? He didn't fall for it, so we know we don't have to fall for it. But he used the Word of God. Because he, I mean, he knew the word. He was the word of God. He is the word of God. So we, so that's the example. But if you skip those chapters, then you can have these really nice messages. And, you know, God's cool with that. Does God really care if you do that? That's the stuff that you'll hear in your head. And you know what I say? Father, what do you say? Was having the mind of Messiah. Okay, Lord. But what do you say? You know, because people get buried with depression and they start thinking that their life is worthless because they're in an app where they see people that look beautiful and they go, I'm not beautiful. Well, there's a filter. So I'm going to use the filter so that I look better. It's deception. It's deception. So science actually proves something here that in, I think people from Harvard wrote a story about this it, that it says that social media was designed to send bursts of dopamine to your brain. And dopamine is something that causes your neurotransmitters to receive a rush, like a happiness feeling. It's a, but what it does is it's short-term, and it's not real. You know, if you see people check, they re- refresh their feeds. Was that what they call that? They refresh their feeds? Okay, thank you. So you refresh your feed, and you go, oh, I got another five likes. And they've actually done it, so they delayed it so that you'll get more. It's, cr- it's nuts. But this is what people are so addicted to not me but you know <laughs> God's working on me actually I've left the house a few times without my phone until I got a few miles away and I was really angry and then I was like hey actually that's not a bad thing but so here's the answer I believe this is what James is saying chapter 4 verse 7 and this whole verse this whole chapter is about warning about worldliness therefore Submit to God. Moreover, take a stand against the adversary, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, 
and he'll come close to you. What a beautiful promise we have there. Man, he's just waiting on us. Clean your hands, sinners. Now here's the rebuke, but we need it. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. Wail, mourn, sob. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he lift you up. Lift you up. That epistle of James is one that many Bible studies are done with in men's circles and it's beautiful because it really slaps you in the face. And sometimes we need that slap in the face. Um, The key is stay in the word. The word is alive. It is alive. And when I was living in Michigan, we had a fellowship, and there was this portion of scripture that we used to sort of incorporate into our fellowship, because I think we were unlearning so many things, and it was, it was really hard to unlearn a lot of things, but I felt like God was really showing us something through this letter to Titus, and I know that Paul was sending Titus on a, on a journey, so I, it was a, Titus 2, 11 through 14, and then I added 15 for a reason that you'll see. So we would say, this is how we believe. For God's grace, which brings deliverance, has appeared to all people. Deliverance is the key. It teaches us to renounce godlessness and worldly pleasures and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives now in this age. Now. Not, Not there. Now. While continuing to expect the blessed fulfillment of our certain hope, which is the appearing of the Shekinah, the glory of our great God, and the appearing, the appearance of our deliverer, Yeshua, the Messiah. It's the hope of glory. Check out Romans 8.18 on that one. The suffering now won't compare to the glory, guys. We have to remember that. And he gave himself up on our behalf in order to free us from all violation of the Torah and purify for himself a people who would be eager to be, who would be his own, eager to do good. We're his. Look, it says to free us from violation of Torah, not from the Torah, from violation of the Torah. And then he tells Titus, these are the things that you should say, meaning you, we should say this. Encourage and rebuke with full authority and don't let anyone look down on you. So this is the message that you should be sharing with people. Wake up, stand up, fill up with the Holy Spirit, fire up, shine your light in the glory of your Father in heaven, and don't let anyone look down on you, because you are a child of the Most High God. Finally. This is great. We know the beginning. We know what we're dealing with now. We know the answer. But we have to have an end to the story. What's this hope we have? The return of Yeshua, right. But what's the result? What's the result? It's the end of deception. And it's coming soon. The enemy knows his time is short. Because everything that's been said in here, it's been prophesied in here, it's been fulfilled so far. There's not a whole lot left. So we have to remember that and bank on the fact that he's coming back and there's going to be something that happens. So let's, uh, let's look at Revelation 20, 3a, 7, 8a, and 10. He threw him into the abyss, locked it and sealed it over him so that he could no longer deceive the nations anymore until a thousand years were over. Okay, so wait, a thousand years are over. Okay, when the thousand years are over, The adversary will be set free from his prison and he will go out to deceive the nations. So it's not totally completed yet. But the adversary who had deceived them was hurled into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever. Praise God for that. The enemy has a destination, but so do we. Let's not forget what our destination is. Because right, what's going on in here? Let's not be fooled. Let's not be deceived. So I pray now that the Lord's mercy is upon us so that he can fight our battles and remove the deception from our lives right now.
and we can live victoriously yes. knowing that this temporary dwelling, yes. which is not our true home, yes. this ain't it. This is not our true home. Since we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. In the words of our Messiah, Yeshua, I say, stay alert. Amen and amen. Thank you. You can stand. You can stand together now. David, will you come up? Grab somebody's hand beside you. I remember I was reminded this morning. Um, years ago, uh, when Rabbi just got to town, we would start our services with uh, people standing around, yes, holding, holding hands. Yes. You know, that circle of unity. Um, and I think it's a sign of our friendship and love for one another because that's how they'll know we're different. So be encouraged. What a great message. Stay alert. Um, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Prince of Peace, the Shar, Shar Shalom, Yeshua. Yeshua. <laughs> Vehuneka Isa Adonai Panoveleka Via Simleka Shalom Shabbat Shalom.